We live in an incredibly exciting universe. Look up, and you see a sky filled with visible matter, stars, planets, galaxies. But there's also dark matter that you can't see. In addition, 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy, a mysterious enigma that is responsible for driving the acceleration of the universe. I have the best job in the world. I want to understand what makes the universe tick and change. But let me take you to a dark city street without, head, without street lights. If you were trying to cross the street in such a beautiful, amazingly strange landscape, this image by Jared Levy of Manhattan, darkened by Hurricane Sandy, can take us there. And if you wanted to cross the street safely, you would use the headlamps of oncoming traffic to tell you if it was safe to cross. The brighter the headlamps, the closer the car would be to you, and you'd know it's probably better to stay on the sidewalk. But how do you know how to do that? If you grew up in a city, you know it's just built in, the ability to calibrate brightness with distance. And yet it relies on one key fact, that all car headla headlamps are made equally intrinsically bright. That allows you to turn them into what we call standard light sources or standard candles. We do the same in the universe as a whole. As a cosmologist, I'm interested in understanding how the universe changes with time, how it is expanding, and how its geometry changes. I do this by measuring bright objects in the far distant universe. This incredibly beautiful image of a galaxy, with its dusty spiral arms and its hazy central bulge, which is made up of a composite of data from distant, different telescopes by B.J. Fulton, is beautiful in its own right. But I'm more interested in the after image, in which you can see a stellar explosion in the outskirts of the galaxy. We call that a Type 1a supernova. Now, supernova come in many types, but the Type 1a supernovae uh, we believe come from an explosion of a white dwarf star. This white dwarf has lived in a companionship with another larger star and has been pulling material off the star, feeding itself, until it can't resist the crush of its own gravity, and it explodes, often brighter than so that it outshines the galaxy that hosts it. We can see these bright objects very far into the universe. The important thing is that these Type 1a supernovae explode everywhere in the universe with roughly the same mass. They also have the same amount of chemical elements, like iron and nickel, and so they explode with the same brightness. They become cosmic standard candles, standard light sources in the dark night. Because we know how bright they are intrinsically, and we measure how bright they appear to be, they become just like those headlamps and we can use them to calibrate the distance to the object. We want to measure the distance to these objects very far away because, because of the constant speed of light, the further away we look, the further into the universe's past we're looking. The reason why we want to do that is because we want to understand this dark energy at different times in the universe. How much dark energy was there when the dinosaurs were on the Earth? I know you're all worried about that. How much dark energy was there when the solar system itself was forming? These are all incredibly important questions. Because we want to measure these distant objects, they become fainter and fainter, and we need bigger and more impressive telescopes with which to do that. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is currently being constructed in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. LSST, you can see how large it is by just comparing the tiny human figure um, in the image. LSST is enormous, and it's going to give us an amazing view of the cosmos. It has a 3,200 megapixel camera. If you think the camera in your phone is roughly 100 times, even if it's a very good phone, it's 100 times uh, less than that. And LSST will scan the entire sky every three days. Try doing that with an iPhone. Just to see what LSST will show us, we're going to go and zoom in on a patch of the sky and look how it changes as our observations have changed. We start with digitized old photographic plates, and we're going to zoom in on one galaxy. Look how it changes with um, observations. Next, we go to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, itself an amazing survey that revolutionized the field that I work in. 
The deep lens survey gives us an even crisper and clearer view, but it was a much smaller survey and didn't do the whole sky. But these simulations of what LSST will see show us just how our view of the cosmos is going to change. We're going to see incredible objects that we've never imaged before. So this is great, right? There's, there's no problem. What's the catch? Well, let's imagine that all the 1,000 currently known uh, Type 1a supernovae are like this fish. Awesome, well understood, we can see it very clearly. We know that we can use it for cosmology, and that's fantastic. But LSST is going to give us roughly 100,000 candidate Type 1a supernovae per year for 10 years. That's a million candidate supernovae. We're now going to have a data set that looks more like this. It's great, we have a lot of data, but we won't be 100% sure that every point is in fact a Type 1a supernova and is relevant for cosmology. We want to make sure we use the data effectively so that we get the correct answers, but also use the power from this huge school of fish. Luckily, the Reverend Thomas Bayes can help with that. Bayes lived in the 18th century and was more interested in religion and gambling, but actually his statistical theorems can help us today. To illustrate just how Bayesian statistics works, I'm going to use another analogy, because as scientists, this is something we love to do. Imagine I told you that today I rocked up here using my own personal dragon. <laughs> okay, you don't believe me, clearly. But if we just look at the data at hand, I'm standing on the red dot. My theory explains that perfectly. So why don't you believe me? You're relying on a prior knowledge that dragons don't exist. <clears throat> In fact, that prior knowledge is so strong that it overrides the fact that I'm standing here today. Bayes' theorem allows us a way to quantify that, the way of balancing whether or not my theory explains the data, which we call the likelihood, and my prior belief in how realistic that model is in the first place. We call this the prior. I use Bayesian cosmology to understand this large data set that I'm going to get from LSST, this school of fish, where we're not 100% certain uh, which is or isn't a type 1a supernova. That's our prior. And we use this to understand cosmology. So here is something, uh, the results that I got from a simulation of LSST-like data. And what we're interested in is constraining the amount of dark matter in the universe, that's on the x-axis, and the amount of dark energy on the universe, that's on the y-axis. Everything within one of these ellipses is, this, uh, is indistinguishable from uh, one model from the other. And so we want to make those ellipses as small as possible because that's saying we have a tighter and tighter bound on our cosmological model. Now, the problem is we want to be centered around the bright star in the middle of the yellow ellipse. I simulated the data, and so that's the right answer. But if we just use the huge data set without paying careful attention to the prior, we, in fact, get something that's shifted away, so the blue ellipse. And that's the wrong answer, and we're not doing correct cosmology. I'm really interested in not only being precise, but getting the right answer in the universe, because I want to understand how the universe works. We live at an incredible time at the moment because we have new observations that are going to give us access to incredible parts of our cosmic history. I can use amazing data from wonderful telescopes and advanced statistics to unlock the secrets of our amazing universe. Thank you. Please for time. So can I ask you a couple of questions? Please. Um, so just to make sure I understand, you use supernovae as constants to measure the rate at which the universe is expanding. Is that right? Right. We use the brightness of the object, and that gives us the distance. And those distances tell us about what the universe is shaped like and how it behaves with time. Because you can imagine, if it was a little bit further away, that's like stretching space out. And so we can measure these distances to tell us about what shape, what the space the shape of space is. And if you learn what the, sp the shape of space is, what do you hope to learn from that? So that tells us literally what is the universe made of, because uh, from uh, general relativity, the stuff in the universe changes what it is shaped like and how it changes with time. So, you know, you are what you eat, the universe is the same way. Right. Uh, well, I guess that is an important thing to learn. Uh, <laughs> so. 
The LSST, it looks so uh, cool. I was wondering, do you need a library card? You do, you need, no. Um, the great thing about these um, big international collaborations and things that are sponsored by uh, involve the US is that eventually the data will be public so people can play with it uh, and find their, out their own things. Um, I'm getting involved now uh, early on I'm kind of uh, buying myself a library card into LSST so that I can also be involved in understanding how we're going to design the surveys, uh, working with colleagues to say can we look for these stars in a better way and how can we integrate together really well. So one of the questions uh, we hear people talking about in the corridors of TED all the time is, can you give us just a tiny process of dark matter versus dark energy? Just a really quick... This is literally my favorite question. Like, <laughs> literally. So, two seconds, dark matter, dark energy. Dark matter behaves like matter, so it has gravity. It, it ha uh, gravity acts the same way. It's invisible. Okay, so dark matter is me in a Harry Potter invisible jacket. Dark energy is crazy. <laughs> so like me, anyway, no, dark energy is very strange. It acts like an anti-gravity. So nothing about dark energy makes sense. It's acting ag directly kind of against the way we would normally think of it. And it's actually, we call it dark energy because we don't know what it is, but it's, you can think of it more as a kind of anti-gravity force. Okay. That actually, I actually think I understand. <laughs> That's good. Um, and, uh, in the, in the universe of all pieces of the universe, what is like the percentages of each thing? So we have most of the universe is dark energy, which is a problem because we don't understand it. Um, sorry. <laughs> Blame the universe, not me. Um, and then we have roughly sort of 25% of the universe is uh, dark matter, and less than 4% of the universe is stuff we know. So you, me, stars, planets, gas, all of that is less than 4%. So I know the Kepler mission to look for signs of intelligence, uh, potential exoplanets which could support life, was only looking at a tiny piece of the sky, right? Right, right. Uh, so how much can the LSST see? So LSST will scan the whole sky. Uh, so in fact, rather than, so you know, Kepler would look at one detailed patch, uh, but LSST is what we call a survey telescope. So it's designed to measure um, like quantity rather than just only a small bit of sky. So it'll scan the whole sky every three nights. It'll do that so again and again. you just get this massive bucket of data. I that want all then, the data all the time. <laughs> and then you have to interpret it, figure right. out using exactly. Bayesian statistics and other ways. Um, uh, one last question. Are we good to go, by the way? We're good? OK, great. We're just having a chat um, now. Well, actually, I asked you my questions. Uh, but uh, can, can I come visit you down in Chile and like Will you take me in and like show me everything? So I, this is the, this is, I'm going to kill the dream now. This is the thing about being a theorist, is that I, I've never been to Chile. I want to go, but for science, it's actually cheaper for me to have a computer. So you can come to my computer, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's much less sexy. But the food is really good. The food is great at my house, yeah. <laughs> Bye, Thank sweetie. You. Thank you. Oh.